so do, Banners. We've got quite an interesting an interesting episode for several reasons. One of them is that for some reason after the uh after our Christmas party, my setup no longer works. And so I'm on on my mobile and Jamie's already been here for several minutes just Holding the fort while well, I've uh, just shown how incompetent I can be at times. But um, you probably know our, our, our next adventure, mainly for, through through his running through um, running north of South America. Um, but he's he's come here today to talk about his whole life, but also he's been linked with his sponsor. So we're also going to be, and I'm just going to shut the door while I'm saying this because I can hear Briggs has just walked in. And um, <laughs> we're also going to be talking about his relationship with his, his sponsor, which is why this episode has happened. And I'd love to explore how that's come about and, and the implications of it because it I've, I've never, we've never been approached by... <laughs> And now it, I've put my phone down on my laptop, which has caused an echo. This is uh, this is just madness. Um, but we've never really spoke, we have, had someone on the podcast who's come on with the, the sponsor leading as well. So I'd love to talk all about that as well. So welcome to the podcast, the wonderful Jamie Ramsey. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Um, we got really, there. We really got excited there. to talk running and adventure. Well, because are you a runner primarily? Well, like, was that the first love? I, I would say that I, I really started as I was started off as a bad runner. Um, I was the yeah. road runner. Um, I, I, I did, it's that very classic journey. I started off with like 5K runs. And then over the years, it's, it's like a drug. You just want to do a bit more every year. So I kind of did the 5K, 10K, half K marathon, marathon, marathon and safari park. And I was just always looking for something a bit bigger to do. What was a safari so park? I would, that was the Lewa Safari Marathon um oh i've got heard of that where's lewa the lewa is in kenya and it was one of those funny ones because i was like i was just doing all these little runs in london and people were like what, what would you like to do and i was like well i'd love to do this safari marathon but no one wants to come and do it with me and then a friend of a friend just called me out and went i'll come and i was like oh oh okay so we're, go we're gonna go and do this so i ended up i bought my tickets and went out to do the safari marathon and then she pulled out um I was <laughs> flying to kenya by myself um, but that kind of gave me the first taste of running, but not on a road. So kind of adding that adventure element. And how, how adventurous was that? Because sometimes you hear of, it, of marathons like that, where you're doing like a, a 3K loop where there's water everywhere, or other times it's, it's properly kind of seam of the pants thrown together without real understanding of what it takes to put in a marathon and, and just thrown into it. I know it was, it was quite a proper marathon. It was quite, I think it was a corporate kind of gig. So there were a lot of big companies like BlackRock, banks and stuff who would bring mm. their employees and customers out to do this experience. And they were they were all staying in these beautiful kind of safari tents and they'd be taken out on like safaris during the day. Uh, I flew into Kenya by myself and uh, had a tent and a backpack, hired a car and people were like, how are you going to get there? I was like, I'm just going to drive. And I like, you can't just drive through Kenya. And I was like, why not? I was like, I'm just going to go and do it. And I arrived and they kind of put me in a field and I set up my little one man tent and uh, everyone else was having this lovely time. And I was just by myself. And then, <laughs> yeah, the actual running, you, you wake up and the helicopter goes up in the morning and it go, it's a it's a double loop. So yeah. you're actually doing a proper long marathon around the Lewa Safari Park. Helicopter goes around, clears all the animals away. The dangerous animals and then you do your your run so it's it's a proper running experience and uh, okay, also that's probably not a guarantee that all the animals go away that's just uh they tend to go away when the helicopter comes but i'm assuming there was a chance that the helicopter oh, yeah. might not <laughs> yeah we saw, we saw we saw rhinos and giraffes and that kind of stuff just as you ran around but um i'm, I'm not gonna lie i was slightly hung over that day so um <laughs> uh, and I, I got my food strategy completely. All I took was super noodles. Um, so I, I really wasn't a runner at that stage. Wow. Uh, was that meant for on the course then? Or was that your, your meal pre-race? No, that I just didn't realise what the setup was. So I just took a bunch of instant noodles with me. I sat in my tent cooking them up. And obviously that was just dehydrating me to death. And when I started <laughs> the race... I saw this American dude who was wearing all the kind of every single bit of running kit you can imagine, looking super stylish. So I got behind him and uh, we did the first lap. And then suddenly he peeled off for the half marathon. And I was like, what, what, what time have we just done this? And it was like 
124 or something. And I was like, <laughs> I've never done a 124 in my life. Um, so I managed to get round in like just over four hours or something. But uh, <laughs> that was that, it was a it was a really really good experience. But um, and and out, and out of interest, what you were saying before about people were saying you shouldn't just drive across Kenya was that because of the the road quality or because it's just dangerous to to go when you don't know it or I think it was just as a single person in a, a white guy in a car driving mm. through a, a landscape where you don't know how things work um, yeah. and what yeah. to look for, what to avoid. Um, so I think they just thought I was rather naive, but it's that naivety, which I, I enjoy. And I've actually used it on every single adventure. I never plan adventures. I never look at the dangers. I never look at what's around the corner. Cause I want to be able to everything I see to be fresh, new and exciting. Yeah. So it kind of, I think maybe that kind of, slapdash way of organizing became like part of my dna of adventuring just because it was so exciting to do has that backfired though at times um it's never backfired in any way that it's been dangerous or i've been injured uh it's backfired in the way that it's been harder than it needed to be but i think mm. when things are harder than they need to be there is a greater sense of achievement when you orchestrate your way what around whatever obstacle it is so i i never regret the fact that i'm not a minute detail kind of planning person so um but you know when you're running like some of the places i've been running solo have just been crazy and i kind of do sit there going what am i doing like why am i here but when you come back you know if you don't have those moments then no one really wants to listen to your story because they're like, oh, it was all easy. It's like that people don't want to hear that. They want to hear when it went wrong. So, and um, but do you, do, are you worried that um, there is a chance that at some point, because you don't necessarily put the research in or the um, the planning, that you will take take on something that basically you shouldn't have done? No, I've got, and my mother actually has. She said that she's. <laughs> I'm, I'm a mummy's boy to tell confess we can get that out there now but um so she's she was worried and then she's watched me doing my adventures and all the different types yeah. and realized that i have a very astute uh switch off button like i'm like that's too dangerous i am not going to do it i will turn around and i don't pride is never going to push me i don't do first i don't do records i'm doing it purely for the my passion for doing it so there's never any reason to push myself into a, a situation which would end up being stupid and um i like to think that i have the knowledge to get me around situations um, i have the skill i have the experience i've got like kind of the history of doing it so i never put myself in a stupid situation so then what was what was the first time you you took on something where you thought um actually i'm gonna use this as If I'm 100% honest, I'd say that I'm probably just getting to that stage now. Um, oh, really? Okay. So, like, I have tried very hard, and I tell people every time I speak or anything, that authenticity is at the heart of what I do. Mm. And But there is a point where, you know, I, I always said, I sold my flat in London, I bought a smaller place, I'm going to try and do as much adventuring as I can until I'm broke. And yeah. obviously, the closer I've become to broke the more that now I'm realizing maybe I need to just become a little bit more commercial. And um, the great thing about the, where I've been to this point is that none of the people I've worked with have wanted me to be commercial. They mm. want me to be authentic because I don't think you always need to follow people who are doing first or doing records. I think you want to see people who are doing it for the passion and make mistakes. And uh, I know what I do, some of the adventures I do are not that relatable, but still the everyday part of it is pretty relatable. And I try mm. to keep that. But I think that, you know, I've been working on a book for six years and hopefully that's nearly finished. I've already got an idea for a second book, which, you know, will be trying to be, I think it's when you start to open up a bit more and show the inside workings. I think that's the bit where you start having to, you become a bit more commercial. Um, so I'm kind of I've, I've managed to do it for eight years I think not being too kind of brand first adventure second um, I want to be 
and uh, I'm lucky that I'm allowed to carry on being that at the moment. So I hope it lasts a bit longer. Although I think uh, like having, I think it's true to connect with individuals. It's, you don't necessarily need to have the firsts and the, the big hook, but often it's the media that really helps at times where the local news stations, the um, getting the, the running media, your men's health and things like that. They almost need that easy soundbite of a uh, kind of explanation. Um, well, should we start with with the the run across the Americas? Because that is I mean, that's yeah. truly crazy. When, when did you start dreaming of that one? Um, oh, it's a very easy one. I talk about it quite a lot in, on YouTube and stuff. Um, so always been a runner. And I kind of got up to the stage where I'd entered into a race in Vietnam. Um, it was 240 kilometers, the Vietnamese jungle marathon, and that got cancelled. And I was very upset that that got cancelled. I bought my ticket and I had all my kit and I'd done all my training and I started raising money. And so I was a bit like, oh, that's a bit, that sucks. And then I was like, no, sod this. I can still do this race. So I flew out to Da Nang in Vietnam, got off the plane, stuck in an extra pair of shorts and a T-shirt and just ran the 240 kilometers by myself down the edge of the highway just to be able to to do what I said I would do, even if the race wasn't going to happen, I was still going to go to Vietnam. So I was just running down Class. the road and just finding places to sleep at night. And I'd never done, like I I took off my running shorts at night. I was running in such extreme humidity that, that my white running shorts, never a good idea to long distances in white <laughs> shorts, but they were red with blood and I'd have to like clean out the blood every night and because of the chafing and all this kind of stuff. So when I got, but when I got to the end of that experience, I had this uh, kind of feeling of fulfillment and um, I felt happy and I felt satisfied with who I was. And then we rolled forward like, uh, I think it was probably uh, six months and I'd been out drinking with friends and I was just doing too much of the drinking with friends. And it was a, uh, one night where I just, I went out, it was a Wednesday, we all got very drunk, it was like three o'clock in the morning and there was a choice to either go west to my house and then into work in the morning or just go straight to work. And I thought it'd be a good idea to go straight to work. So I went straight to work, slept there, woke up the next morning at work going, this is not normal. Like this is not what normal healthy people do. Uh, so that was November. Then I started thinking like, when was the last time you were happy, fulfilled, satisfied? And I, it took me back to that moment of finishing that race in Vietnam. So then I started going like, I'm going to quit my job. I've been doing this career for 12 years. I don't and enjoy it. What was your career out of interest? I was doing financial communications. So for someone who liked partying, it was quite a good job because you were doing so much socialising and the socialising was kind of disguised by the mm. fact that you were working in a job that's quite social. So I kind of kind of decided that I needed to, to go in a completely different direction. I wanted to do passion first because I'd had 12 years without that. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to do traveling. I wanted to do running, and I wanted to meet people. And I kind of like, I can't just run a marathon or a marathon to solve. I have to go do something big. So mm. I was like, okay, a year, three hundred sixty-five days, roughly thirty kilometers a day. That gives you eleven thousand kilometers. And then start looking at the map. And I looked at around the world, and I was like, I don't have the money, the skill. There's too many war zones. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that. So then I looked down through the Africas and same kind of thing. Mm. And then I just set it, settled on Vancouver to Buenos Aires. And I liked the fact that it wasn't the full Americas. Like, so I wasn't doing a first or a record or a, I was just going from one really cool place to another really cool place through some countries that were easier to travel through because the British visa would, the British passport would give you the visas. You didn't have to do anything there. There was only two languages. Um, so the kind of admin side was less. Mm. So I just kind of settled on the route from Vancouver to Buenos Aires and I kind of just had to work out, out my notice and then I left my work on the 28th of July 2014 and started running on the 14th of August, the same like two weeks later. I just flew out. No idea what I was doing, like no idea. I just had this ba baby stroller stuffed full of the most useless crap ever uh just standing in the middle of a town going right i'm gonna run to argentina and i was like that's all that was running through my head well before we start on this one let's go back to that being vietnamese experience then because 
I imagine from what I know of the Jungle Ultra, it's um, the kind of kit you'd have wouldn't be great for roads and um, anything along those lines. And like, we, how, how hard was that um, physically, but also logistically? Because like Vietnamese roads can be pretty risky, even in the car, let alone if you're running. And then having to provide your own nutrition and and drink and things like that like how how tricky was it actually in, in practice um well as as i said i didn't really know what i was doing so i just kind of started and my backpack was heavy it was like literally i'd because i because the race had been cancelled i booked a week holiday in this resort uh in the trang so i had all that stuff in the backpack as well <laughs> and i just had i what did i have i had one of those uh french website uh french wet, uh rucksacks oh I've forgotten the name of it really good rucksack and um i just stuffed everything in and just headed off running and you know the first day i nearly died from dehydration mm. so every day i would just get up a little bit earlier and i was started running at, i think it was like 5 a.m by the end of just getting up and i don't want to take away from the hardness because but if you're only doing like just under a marathon a day you start at 5 a.m kind of finished by mid-morning and then you you are actually just on holiday because you can't you're not just going to sit in a room so you do go mm. sightseeing um and actually you finished by the time you get to lunch and dinner so you just have a normal lunch and dinner in a restaurant uh, i ate a, i ate a lot of pho um so the, the, so was it fairly in, in fairly built up areas then or were you always able no, to no no it's so the one that if anyone's been to Vietnam, it's kind of it's a, as it's a long, thin country. There's a kind of lots of hubs that people tra uh, travel to and mm. then but they're doing it by train or bus. So the hubs are very kind of tourist friendly. But the bits in between are like ancient kind of communist towns and like chickens running around. So you have like this wonderful um, experience of seeing things that other tourists don't really get to see. Mm. And I think it was that kind of that experience which led me to want to use running as the mode of transport i would use to go traveling uh just because i saw things i didn't think i would see so um but it was all just like as every single endurance person would say it's just if you have the mental strength to not let the bad times get you down and just keep pushing and find the positives every day then if you you know if you're a bit dehydrated you just learn how to walk up and ask people for help and if you don't have anywhere to stay mm. you, know, you, you get on the phone to your, your family and say help i need someone to help me find a hotel or a hostel or a um so yeah it was yeah it was a, just a really good experience i mean and, and talking about family you mentioned your mother's mother's voice you mentioned their potential calls home when you break the news to them that you were quitting your job to go to america how did they respond so I kind of, I have this strategy of telling people who are furthest away from my family first to gauge their their reaction to what I'm thinking about doing. And by the time I worked up to my dad, I wrote him, like sitting there going, dad, you paid a lot of money for my education. I'm about to throw the whole thing away. Um, so I was, and I just made partner. So I was, I'd just been made partner. Oh, this wow, okay. so I was yeah. like, I was, from, but from the outside, it was like, yeah, this guy's got a house, a car, uh, a girlfriend. Uh, and I had just broken up actually, uh, but he's made partner. But on the inside, I was just not happy. So I mm. kind of wrote to my dad. Uh, I didn't phone him. I wrote an email saying, Dad, this is what I'm going to do. And he didn't reply immediately. It was like 36 hours. And I was just like, oh, God. And, and did you write to him? Did you write it to him because you wanted to get it written clearly in the way you wanted? Or was it because you were scared to call? No, I think it was just the way we normally communicated. Okay. And, uh, um, and he, he just replied, you got to do, you got to do what you got to do. That was it. I was like, okie dokie, <laughs> we're, we're doing this. And, <laughs> um, and, and at that point, it wasn't, it wasn't like, so I've now done over 50,000 kilometers of adventuring, but that was never the mm. intention at that point. At that point, I was doing one adventure and that was it. So mm. I was just, it was, a, it was kind of like a sabbatical slash life change of direction. So yeah, I was just, uh, just kind of quit my job and away I went. So then we, your stroller then, we'll take you back to that stroller. What did you have in the stroller then that you, at the time, was necess necessities? So, like, I had a, I had a, 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 um, a 
fuel burning trangier, like the massive big metal trangier. I had a laptop. I had a massive super dry hoodie. Um, I had just so much stuff that I would probably be able to fit into a backpack now with the knowledge I've learned. Mm. Um, but I just kind of, you know, I, I, I have this stroller. So I filled it with everything I could possibly. And, you know, I, did, I couldn't afford anything. I didn't have enough money. Mm. I think this is an important thing. I didn't have enough money when I started to finish. Um, and I'd, I'd kind of been around a few of the adventure talks and mm. stuff. And I heard people talking about like, oh, I was going to do this thing, but I didn't have enough money. And it's like, but you had enough. I was like thinking you had enough money to do a bit of it. Like, so even if you do a bit of it, that's cool. So mm. I was just like of the belief that if I started, I would find the money along the way. So things like running shoes, I was just using my old running shoes that I'd been using to do marathons in, which were completely the wrong shoes to be to be running. So I was just I was begging, borrowing, stealing whatever I could just to have the, roughly the right kit so I could get the adventure kind of on the go. And so, so you hadn't booked a return ticket. It was one way and and stuff. It was one way. It was I don't. T- I didn't even know where I was going to be sleeping on the end of the first day. I just yeah. stood stood at the thing and thought, right, we're going to do this thing. And uh, I don't know how long it's going to take. Uh, I had a kind of rough idea in my head. I'd said to myself, five days on, two days off, thirty k's running a day was yeah that, was. And I learned very quickly that that was the worst way to plan an adventure. So, um, why? Well, what were the flaws of that then? So, if you say to yourself, "I'm going to run five days on, two days off, thirty mm. kilometers a day," that is all you will do, and you'll either mm. sell yourself short by only doing that, or you'll push yourself too hard to make yourself do that, and you'll end up getting injured. Um, and also, you know, towns aren't based 30 kilometers apart mm. um, or places to camp. So, you know, I learned very quickly that being adapting. So I, I, I very quickly after probably a week, I ended uh, entered into this kind of only ever knowing where I was going to stay the next night or the next two nights and never plan more than that um, because it just takes away that whole stress and it allows you to push. So, you know, for the example, I started off by doing five days on, two days off. And I finished by uh, running 28 days straight without a rest, running 58 kilometers a day in 40 degree heat. So like if I had stuck to this little pattern, I would mm. never realize that I could run that distance, just not even thinking about it. That was just, that was my day job. I'd get up and I'd run 60 K. Um, so... Was that was that why it was five days and two? Because it was like a job you were thinking as... I... I think I think in my subconscious that's probably where I was going. But I, also, I had to. I always told myself this is not a holiday. Mm. This is a job. Like you're not you're not quitting your job to go on holiday. You're quitting your job to be productive. So I guess that I kind of put that into the kind of planning. In and because, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, it's just like because if you if you see yourself as you're on a holiday, you arrive at places. There's a party going on. You're like, I'm going to join the party because I'm on holiday. And, you know, very quickly, I realized that is just not sustainable if you're running. And we'll probably get onto it later. But my adventure fell into two very clear distinctions. I did the first six or the first half, like to Panama City, drinking. Mm. And I did the second half not drinking just to see what the difference would be. And it was amazing how the difference was on performance, but also interaction with people and how i it how i had relationships with towns and solitude and things like this so you know so when, you, when you say drinking how how drinking drinking was drinking oh no we weren't getting lashed i wasn't getting lashed every night i was more like it was becoming a reward it was coming like mm. if you get to the end of the day you can have a beer um and that beer would probably end up being too like it would increasingly get more beers yeah and 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 that was probably because i was trying to cope with certain other things and you know i i when i was in the middle of nowhere i would drink and I, i'd have this kind of desire to get to a city to be around people and then i would charge my hardest to get there i'd arrive and then realize that i didn't want to be there so i then 
get slightly depressed and start drinking to get over that and I'll want to just get out of the town. So then I'd leave the town and then a week later I'd be like, I need to get back to a town and the cycle would come. So I was like, just, I went, I flew back for my sister's wedding when I hit Panama City and uh, on the flight back, I said, right, that's it. I'm not going to drink for the second half. And then I didn't drink for 14 months after that. So. And so what, what do you think in that cycle was, because I, I think it's completely understandable, the desire to go and meet people and hang out with people. So that doesn't seem unusual. What, why, why when you then got to cities, were you not wanting to be there? Because I wasn't like everyone else. So I'd be staying in hostels. And I remember like when you're in, so when I actually got to Peru, I kind of managed to understand it a bit more. And I'd be like, well, I'm not drinking and tomorrow I've got to run 50k across a desert and you just don't have anything in common with people who are on holiday when you're trying to do an extreme endurance adventure so you kind mm. of there is that kind of I want connection but when you find the connection it's the wrong kind of connection so you kind of then realize that actually the purity of your own com- company is actually a healthier way to be to That's achieve cool. what to to achieve what it is you're trying to achieve and i was very much i am going to achieve this no matter what so yeah i wonder if that's um that's partly down to the approach actually because i'm just trying to think of other other friends who've kind of run across the states or who've and maybe it's different in central america to kind of north america but I'm trying to think of people like annie mcnaff or jamie ramsey um and Jamie I, I Donald. James, sorry, what am I saying? Sorry. Jamie McDonald, of it was, course. It was it was him I got the idea to run with the uh stroller. Oh yeah, of course. I mean it's so I it's, looked up I was like, oh he moved to a stroller, let's go there. Yeah, he's they're, they're both amazing. Yeah, and um but I I get the sense that their experience was more wasn't necessarily city to city and was actually more kind of house to house always in the middle of nowhere which meant they were never so were you do you think you were possibly staying in hostels more than um people like annie or, or jamie or uh oh i was i was trying to sleep in a tent i wanted okay. to sleep in a tent a tent was my favorite place to sleep uh i would sleep in like roadside hotels and stuff places where it was yeah. slightly more da- dangerous um and it just when you look at the police and the people walking around with guns you're like you know what i've got a lot of money and a passport here i'm not gonna risk it um because they, i'm not a survivalist i'm a runner um mm. and i think i think the way that anna and jamie do things that it's more of a it's more about the people and the meeting people and the kind of i think they like the company of other people mm-hmm. um i'm i i am i i would say I'm, I'm a loner i live in a house by myself in south france and like i'm not married don't have children uh, i've and i i'm kind of i shy i when i do adventures i want to be alone because i'm wanting to push myself to my absolute maximum and i don't I don't, it sounds like I'm not a nice sociable person, but I don't want to arrive at someone's house and then have to like be all nice and play with their kids and then tell them the story and then wake up the next morning and not be able to perform at the best I am able to perform. Um, mm. So, And do you, do you, do you ever find people fueling? Cause that there, there maybe is an element, well, the fact you have that desire to get into cities and meet people suggests that there there is an element of that, and so actually there could be an element that mixing with the right people would would help you perform better. Um, on running adventures, no. Other adventures, maybe. Uh, I think it was like magnets. So I think the the pool of the city would encourage me, and as soon as I arrived in the city, the the push of the city would help me get out again and then it was just I I think I'm like a goldfish I just forget the feeling I had I'm like oh there's a nice shiny town let's go back there and uh but for me the the I was more interested in the the bits in between the towns so like I got Mm -hmm. to do some incredible like I I ran across I, I I ran across the Atacama Desert. I ran along a road through the Atacama Desert. Uh, I ran across the Andes. I ran across the Satura Desert. 
um you know these are kind of that's where i got my fuel to kind of keep going mm. those desires to get to these to get to all the things that people said i couldn't do um it was like i've got to prove you wrong uh, so and and the geography of that whole route how many almost different challenging areas would you say would you if you were to break it down into into chunks of that's kind of that bit that's that bit yeah so uh, a lot of people ask how i uh, like do i fear failure and i i kind of use this that system to kind of get me through that because i'd be like so i set myself success barriers along the way mm. so like getting to the start line was success you quit your job you got to the start you showed resource to get here well done if you don't want to go through it you don't need to feel ashamed then if you run to the end of the united states then well done you just doesn't that, matter if you that, get to the end was that a fear that you wouldn't start that you'd get there no and- no no it wasn't but i kind of put okay. these systems in place to allow myself to not have that pressure yeah um so then when i if i ran across the united states i'd be like work it work it i just ran the length of the united states that's awesome hardly anyone's done that cool um, and then the next one was uh, Panama, and then the next one was Buenos Aires. So I kind of put that into the stage. And then on overlay on top of that, you kind of look at the map and go, all right, so America is going to be my training ground in the United States because everyone speaks English. If I need anything, I can go and buy it. Mm-hmm. So this is just a training run to get that first 2,900 kilometers training. Then you hit Mexico. This is where the, the challenges start because – you know, everyone's carrying guns. You don't speak the language. Um, it's going to be a lot more taxing. And then there's, and then there were like, as I got further, there were like longer. Then you get to a signpost saying no petrol stations for 320 kilometers, and you're like, I got to carry all my water, all my food for the next 320 kilometers in a desert. Like, so. Mm. But you, I, the the great thing about the run is all the hard bits with the ends. So as I come up, I had to get myself around the Darien Gap between Panama and Colombia. Uh, mm. Yeah, and then I had to uh, run three thousand meters through Quito. Then I had to run across the Satura Desert in the north of um, uh, Peru. But knowing that when I was running across that little desert, I had to run across the Atacama Desert later, and, and then then I had to run at four thousand eight four thousand eight hundred and thirty meters pushing a running stroller like so I was I always knew and I always had these voices going you like from the start saying you can't do this and I was like well I will prove you wrong and I think it's all those naysayers say to you you can't do this I was like every time I hit something I'd be like this is not the challenge this is just a a kind of training exercise because I have to get up this hill if I'm going to get across the Andes so you just keep never look at anything you're doing as the thing you're doing use it as training for the next thing uh, and it worked because when I arrived at the Atacama I was like people told me I couldn't do this and they were right the person who started this run could not have done the Atacama Desert or the Andes when they start when I started but I've used every kilometer and every day to train myself but when I arrived like I wasn't even it's not that I was at all even daunted by the Atacama Desert I was like this is I finally got a challenge because I've been running just down roads every day. Now I've got this massive challenge ahead of me. Uh, things have got exciting again. So, um, and, and who were those naysayers typically? The typically, uh, <laughs> there were typically fat guys in the city who basically anyone who tells you you can't do something is them just looking at what you're hoping to do and going. I can't do that. So therefore, I don't think you should be able to do that. And they mm. think they if they don't have the physical or the mental or the emotional strength to take on a challenge of a certain size, they don't want you to do it, uh, well, some people, and they will try and scare you from it. But, you know, you just take that and you just use it as fuel to take you uh, to the next next day and to push yourself a little bit harder. And so, yeah. So, and you you mentioned about how there were a few a few times that almost turned you in the person capable of, of then going across the last desert. What would you say those key moments were? Um, the Satura Desert was a a, a nightmare. Well, I don't. I arrived, the so the desert. Satura Desert, the Satura Desert, is the kind of massive desert in the north of Peru. Mm. Um, and I was running towards it, and I was feeling all very happy. And I got this email from uh, some travelers I'd met, cyclists, and they're like. 
don't take the road from here to here. And I was like, oh, that's annoying. It's like 200 and something kilometers. And they were like, yeah, we got held up by gunpoint. We got shot at. We got robbed. Um, whatever you do, do not take this road. It is highly dangerous. And I was like, looked on the map. And I was like, well, it's the only road. So I have no choice. So I just kind of put it to the back of my head and kept running, kept running. And then I woke up the day to enter this. It was going to be a four day stretch. And I entered uh, kind of running out the town. A woman and children were looking at me and like slitting their throats with their fingers and shaking their heads and saying, you can't go out there. And I'm like, oh, for God's sake. So I'm just pushing my stroller into the middle of the desert going. And it's the first time I was I actually thought. This is quite selfish, like uh, Mm. if I got killed. I'm dead, but my mom and my sister and my family, they're all going to have to pick up the pieces and they're the ones that are going to deal with my stupidity. So I was kind of like running on, questioning myself. And then I arrived at a a kind of checkpoint and the police, and I was like, everyone's telling me I can't do this. They can tell me I'm going to die. And they're like, oh, no, you'll be fine. It's like, oh, well, if the police say you'll be fine, you'll be fine. So I just started running out and then like 40 minutes later, a police car pulled, the same police pull up next to me. And they're like, actually, we've had a think about this and uh, we don't think this is very safe. So we're going to give you an escort. Um, so they leapfrogged me for the whole day. A, a, a cyclist joined me. We found, oh, an no old, I found an old, it was a cyclist I'd met in Peru, Mexico and North America. So it was the third time I'd met him. And uh, we ended up camping in like a disused uh, petrol station. The police were like, you will sleep here. You will not leave. We will be back at seven o'clock tomorrow morning. And at seven o'clock the next morning, they were there. And then they carried on giving us this escort. And then um, they... I wasn't expecting them to actually get involved in it almost. As a... It's quite a big thing, right? I think a few people had been held up at gunpoint. And I think Mm. they probably radioed in and the chief said... Well, we can't have any more of that. So good. But then they ditched us in the middle of the desert. And they were like, we're at the end of our jurisdiction. I was like, what? So they just <laughs> left us. So I ended up running 78 kilometers that night and I arrived at this place. And after running 78 kilometers through in the headwind in a desert, I was like, oh, I arrived. And they put a plate of food down in front of me in this little roadside restaurant. And I ate it. And then the next morning woke up with just chronic diarrhea. And then you're like in the middle of this place where you think you're going to get killed and I couldn't run more than a kilometre. And I had a choice. It was like, you either run a kilometre, take a shit, and then they run another kilometre. Or you stay at the place where you've got food poisoning and get get it again. So I was like, right. So I ran 42 kilometres in with not being able to hold any food or water down in a desert. You know, at the beginning, every time I was like, beginning, I'd be like British and run like 500 yards into the desert to do my business. By the end of the day, I was just like waving to buses as they went past and I had my trousers, my shorts down my ankles. But when I got to the end of that, to get back to your question, I was like, oh, I just got over this massive milestone in one of the most dangerous places I've been. And I did it in not the easiest way. I did it as every single thing that possibly go wrong went wrong and I survived. So let's just crack on. And it just gave me that little, little extra boost that I could run across deserts. It's not really a problem. So um atacama bring it on and and in terms of food and, and drink did you start to develop your own rule book of what you should and shouldn't buy and what works and what looks good but isn't i would have liked to have had that luxury but it doesn't really work like that i i, I basically would have in the morning i would have two sachets of quaker oats uh kind of a coffee an instant coffee and if any fruit if i had it and that would be my thing. And then I would eat just whatever I could find at lunch and dinner. Mm. And down in that part of the world, it's basically going to be a bit of, it's either going to be something really delicious or it's going to be rice, beans, meat, uh, mm. which is actually pretty good if you're running. Um, and apart from the time I peed blood, I didn't really have any other problems. So, And we... Um... We we spoke to one gentleman who's still trying to hike around the world, and he talked about was it the Durian Durian Gap? Is it called the Durian um, Gap? Is that Carl Bushby? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, I love Carl. Amazing. I went and joined him for his, I joined him for part of his Mongolia part. Stint. Oh, but is he is he still waiting it around, or has he managed to? Yes, 
So he's uh, just met up with well, him and Angela, who is also in Mongolia with me. They're about to swim the Caspian Sea, I think. So oh, in instead Mexico. of doing the run, no, yes, so the, uh, the, the way that that trip is not, it's not a continuous trip, so he keeps kind of yeah. going back. Yeah, yeah. So he's currently in Mexico at the moment with Angela, and I saw on Instagram that they're training to swim across the Caspian. I would love to go back and do that with them, that would be. <laughs> But, yeah. Well, we I think anyway, we had about a, a five-hour podcast with him just talking about. Uh, he's yeah, amazing. I love him. I, he's an amazing guy. Um, um, so what? Because he he was he was explaining how he was that was almost going through the front line of two rival armies. It, it seemed um, at the time he was going through. I mean, did you find it incredibly dangerous there as well? So yeah, he 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 did it properly. He went right through the middle. Um, behind the excuse that you can't push a baby stroller through a jungle. So I actually, my plan originally was to to run to Panama mm. and then uh, get a, a boat across to Cartagena and then carry on from there. I actually arrived, I arrived in Cartagena massively early for my flight back from my sister's wedding. And I kind of just sat there twiddling my thumbs and I was going, well, it's only 300 kilometers to the end of the road. So I might as well just do that because I've got nothing else to do. So I ran all the way to the Darien Gap and I went and informed the police that I was there. And they, uh, in the base, there were like a chalk. There was well, one, there was a bunch of guys sitting on the ground surrounded by policemen with guns, uh, soldiers with guns. And then there was a board up in the office, which just had all the different countries and just like a number count for how many people illegal immigrants had come across. Um, um, so at that point, I then uh, went back to Panama City, went to my sister's wedding, came back and then tried to go across by water. Uh, but that didn't work. So then I flew to the border of uh colombia and ecuador in uh panama and colombia in the darien and then got motorboats along the thing so i kind of i did the easy option <laughs> but, and, uh, um, you know but my, my my i'm not he he's on a mission my luckily my the flexible lines around mine allowed me to to do that and actually I, i'd love to hear your take on it because we were left at the end of those kind of five six hours almost worried for his he's just so transfixed on having to to walk the whole thing you know he'd never been back since he'd left it since his son was one um he'd split up with his i think nine year relationship because of it um and i i i just was really worried what would happen if when he finishes so the, the wonderful thing about Carl is, and I don't know if he talked about it, but he has all these little side pro projects on the side. He's trying to set up education places where, where he goes. So in Mongolia, he was setting up like, I can't, I didn't understand it massively, but it was like teaching kids about space and stuff. So he's mm. got all these little projects he's doing along the side. So even though this massive goal he's aiming towards will one day disappear mm. i think he's built up a, a number of other things along the side which are his passions so i guess he would just split his time up more between those passions because um, I'd, i'd love to be there when he his first walk around his hometown when he gets back and just yeah yeah it's gonna be just crazy just the, the, the contrast but um yeah, yeah. anyway anyway that's an aside that's an aside back to you back to you <laughs> <laughs> so how did you find the desert then the final desert uh the Atacama I loved it it mm. was uh like literally a straight road you can't see anything either side mm. and you just run and it was probably high 30 degrees um and you just had you know I'd have a a four gallon bottle like like mm. you see the milk milk cartons i just have that full of coca-cola and would just drink that straight and uh you know find the most wonderful places to camp um and meet really cool people and yeah i just loved it and it's just it's just great you cut like i wake up in the morning with blood just pouring down my face from my nose from all the air and you just like rub it on your shirt and carry on running i was by that point i was in such a state that I could just keep going no matter what. So um, I was just, yeah, that's probably Atacama and 
up to the top of the Andes and down into Argentina were my favourite part. And and what was your kind of how were you documenting this journey at the time? Like what was your connection with the outside world and that? I had it. Yeah, I I I made one massive problem uh, mistake. I mean, I should have done a smaller adventure first and learn how to document. I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I just got a whole bunch of really bad videos of me talking into a camera going, oh, well, and I was always like, hi, and then like chatting as if I was talking to a friend or something. So I, my footage wasn't, I couldn't make a documentary out of it. Mm. Um, but that's not what I was doing it. So I don't feel too bad about it. I was doing mm. it for the experience and to come back as a better version of me. And I think I did. So um I, How are you I, better? I, I, had, I had Instagram, so I had that kind of connection with people. But And how would you say you were better? I think I came back with a kind of, of clearer idea of what I wanted to do, um, a better understanding of what I was capable of doing. Um, and it, every single adventure talks about the little circles. When you push the boundary, you kind of learn you, all these other things you could do. And I remember standing at the like 4,800 meters top of the Andes, not a single person anywhere, just like a moon-like uh, landscape and thought, wow, I can do anything. Like I literally, what, what, and I still had two, 3,000 kilometers to go. I was mm. just thinking like, what can I do next? Like what, what's next on the, on the list of things I can do? And then uh, how am I going to pay for it? But um, yeah, so I was just, it kind of it, it just gave me the confidence to be slightly and I, I but one thing I would very much a lot of adventurous people had to do this all like quit your job and do an adventure and you'll come back fixed and you'll be happy. That's complete bollocks. Um, you know, we all have demons and those demons stay with you no matter what you do. You just learn new techniques on how to deal with those demons, how to notice the if you're feeling happy, if you're feeling sad, if you feel like you want to run away and hide, or if you or you're craving something, you learn how to to manage that in a better way and a more productive way and a way that is more um it's better for the people around you. So I think that kind of um and I I still have quite a lot of the same struggles, not that the big struggles, but the ones I had when I started, I still have them. Just, are you happy to talk about those or are they they're just kind of you know i've always always kind of thought i'm not that good um mm. like not talented um and i get a lot of friends go you know that you're the only person that thinks that and i'm like yes but i do think it and you know it's by running and adventuring and being outside and being in nature that i realize that actually I have the skill set that I can use. And the skill set is not about being super fit. It's not about being good at adventures. It's about having the ability to, to manage these negative thoughts and turn them into positive energy. That's the kind of, I, weirdly, I see myself as a coal power station. And I take my negative thoughts about myself and I process them and turn them into positive energy, which is the adventure. And, and then I try and talk about it because, but not in a kind of, talk about it in a I want to be famous way but just like meet people and just ask I think you've got to rework it you've got to rework it though because like cold plants are going out negative kind of take you need to be like more wind you're <laughs> taking the the negative force of people's words the energy from yeah. those turning into yeah. electricity for something like that would work better but, um, are they not reopening coal stations in the UK at the moment yeah true true yeah. Oh, so you're, you're still in touch from France a little bit then <laughs> oh, I am um well before we go on to kind of more adventures i'm, I'm aware that you know you've, you've come on here because of a sponsor Let, let's talk about that like how at what point did sponsorship come into your to, to, when did you start getting backing and, and when did it because and when did it start becoming like a decent size i'll tell you when it gets to decent no um, <laughs> uh it depends what decent size is so my objective has always been I just want to make enough money to do what I want to do in the mm. adventuring world. Like, I don't want to go on holidays. I don't need to buy a flash car. I don't need any of that stuff. I just want to be able to pay for the next adventure. So when I got back, I actually, I went on marathon talk. Mm. Um, I know I did marathon talk while I was running. And then I, they asked me to go to their camp and be the mm. 
So I went to the camp, did the speaker, I got paid some money. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. Someone's going to pay me to talk about this. And then someone in the audience worked for another company and he came up and said, we want to work with you. And I was like, amazing. And then I worked with them and then they took me to uh, Cotswold Outdoor, Runner's Need, all that kind of thing, yeah. um, event. And then they said, well, we don't have a speaker. And so my guys were like, take Jamie. So I got up on stage did a speech there and then they said well we'd love to work with you and then oh, just off the cuff yeah it's nothing ever been like <laughs> and, and it's just always it was, it was kind of we'd sat down and we talked about it and um and it was just like at that time like, there was there was hiking and running and cycling and it was everything i did mm-hmm. and and i just you know well, it's just been an organic relationship of just working together um trying to educate people in things that are important um and i love that you know with cotswold outdoor with runners need um we are they're trying to tell people like it's not you should buy this it's like buy the right stuff it'll last longer it's better for the planet um when you're going to be doing your stuff do it right so we can preserve the places that we are and i was like your messages and my messages are the same and that's why i think we've managed to have this lovely relationship that's lasted a few years because we are they're not trying to make me commercial but i can work with them to share some beliefs that i have so and actually when i when i saw you were sponsored by because i i thought it was just right as easy to begin with and then um because I, I can't remember if it was Dave Cornthway or Sean Conway when they were saying that it's amazing at, at, when they were starting out how much work they were doing just to get a bag. And they they yeah. realised it's, it's better I didn't spend the time doing that and actually chose the kit I wanted. Whereas because you've got pretty much every brand under the sun within Cuts World, Runners Need, in theory, I guess, you can pick and choose exactly what you need. Well... Actually, I was, I remarked that I was going through my kit the other day. I have a box. I have two boxes of my kit and I have the stuff that I use all the time and the stuff that I use less. And actually, all stuff I use all the time, I've had for years and I just reuse it because it is the best at what it does and there's no mm. reason to change it. Um, and if you go back through all my stuff, I'm pretty much telling people to buy the same stuff. Uh, but as I change, the wonderful thing is that when I started for Cotswold Outdoor and Runners Need, I was a runner. And through that kind of, because there are lots of runners needs in Cotswold Outdoor and vice versa, that I've been able to like morph and grow in the stuff that I'm doing by the uh, brands that are available. Because I kind of got back from running the Americas. And I realized, you know, I got back from running the Americas. So I was like, what do I do? So I went and ran the Three Peaks. And uh, I was the first person to apparently ever have done that. I didn't know that, but... Oh, I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so, someone sent me a message saying, Oh, I'm going to try and break your record. And I was like, I don't have any records. He was like, Yeah, yeah. Because I climbed Ben Nevis, ran to Scaffell, and then climbed that, and then ran to Snowdon, but did it all with a backpack camping. And then I ran the length of the uh, to Hebrides and the Isle of Skye. And I kind of got back from that and was like, I, I'm just doing what I know I can do. And then, mm. you know, my kind of natural progression was like, I want to do hiking, I want to do mountaineering, I want to do trail running races as opposed to adventure races uh, ventures so it's just been lovely to be with Cotswold and actually and runners need and be able to to be able to use the right equipment that has allowed me to do what I want to do um mm. and tell people don't make the same mistakes as me don't go and buy something cheap just because you think it's going to fit like buy something that's good and it's going to last a long time mm. um, because um yeah it's better for the planet and the more i see people you know it's great so many people are getting out there at the moment but you see the effect that's having on the environment and you know we have to there has to be people out there educating people on how to responsibly enjoy the outdoors because if we don't it's going to get trashed so uh, and um because we i mean we've we've had this discussion i was i was in, out for pike pike's peak with golden trail and and how there is quite a different relationship between europe uk america and their trails and their kind of what's public land what isn't um did you do you find in the america ship did you find it was substantially different cultures country to country in in how they viewed their space and and how much they welcomed you into yeah. it yeah yeah it, there is a massive difference. I think, the, so 
I'm in France at the moment, and there's just we've got the same population as the UK, but like double mm-hmm. the size. Then you go to America, there's so much space that they there, there is an ability to cater to people's needs in a much easier way. I think mm. when you're running through the Americas into the South, there's less, the poorer the country, yeah. the, less, the less they are able to educate the population on things like plastic and things like responsible adventuring and that kind of stuff. And, you know, if there's a way of making money, they're probably going to go down that route because they have to, yeah. not because yeah, yeah, they're yeah. being negligent, but it's just because they have to. But like in the UK, I think our problem is we've got so many people all wanting to go to the exact same place. Mm. Um, sadly, quite often because there's a really good Instagram shot at the, t- at the top of it. And um, that puts a lot of pressure on on the places. So and but does, that, seen... does that bring you into conflict? Because when you then, does that change how you can choose what you do? Because say after you did the Hebrides, the Hebrides suddenly became a hotspot. Or as, you, as your profile is growing, there will come a point that you will be enticing people in a good way um, to take on some of the things you've done. But what if that, what if you become too big? What if you're too good a magnet? What is, is that a conflict you're worried about? Or At the moment, oh, you see, every time, like when I'm out and you get annoyed by seeing how many people are somewhere, there is part of my brain that goes, oh my God, look at all these people. And then there's the mental health side going, if these people weren't here, they'd be at home playing on PlayStations or down the pub, or they'd be doing something that's not constructive for them. So there definitely has to be a way that the people get to use the outdoors for their own mental health benefits. Mm. Um, And we just have to do that in a way which is more manageable for the countryside. So we, as human beings, we all want to go to the highest mountain. But we don't need to all go to the highest mountain. Go like that's why I try and kind of tell people about places that are. Look, what? Are, why don't we don't do this mountain? Do this mountain because there's hardly anyone there. You're gonna have a way more fun time. There's still a nice track. It's still got the nice um, all the amenities you're gonna need to have a nice day out, even if you're not skilled. But you're taking some of the pressure off because when you see the kind of this, these the lovely routes that up mountains, and then because there's so many people, people are going off and creating side routes and. And that just, you know, and then you get people wild camping who don't know how to wild camp and they're setting fires up. And, you know, the worst one is people going to the loo and just leaving loo paper. And I know that's not a massive, it's not going to, it's going to by degrade pretty quickly, but it's not aesthetically nice and it's not good for the environment. Um, so just, we just need to teach people, you know, if you're, if you're out trail running, if you want to go out for a, a kind of, two day run or you want to do one of these long trails, you know, there is, I'm sure there's a way that we can all do it. We just have to learn how to make it more, educate people how to do it in the right way. And how do you think, because how do you think we can do that realistically? Because if we, at the moment still, uh, most people in the UK aren't that in touch with nature don't do much trail running. I mean, if you compare the the trail running numbers in France compared to the UK, it's it's massive. Um, And as you say, it's smaller. um, But but it's growing. uh, Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's going in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. Um, But is there an element of we we can't have our cake and eat it, and actually there are just too many people for UK trails or – I don't think you can ever get to a point where you can tell people they can't go and use the trails. There just has to be better management of working out how to do that. And, you know, I'm sure that I'm sure that when they made all the car parks pay, like pay and display, you know, part of that mm. is for probably to regulate numbers. Yeah. And part of it will be to create money, partly for profits, but partly for putting in better systems. And, um, you know, I think there's going to have to be some way of opening up like wild camping seems to be the one that's coming up against a lot of attrition at the moment because mm. you're not allowed to wild camp that on Dartmoor I see they're trying to stop wild camping um you know but when you go to places like America they just have designated wild camping spots and mm. you know come first come first serve basis uh they have, they have two tiers you can have like there's some that you pay for and you can book 
and there's some which are first come first serve and i think we need to have that kind of stuff where we can't if you tell people you can't do something they will find a way around it and the way around mm. it will not be as sustainable as saying we're going to come up with a solution for you work with us and we'll manage to make a solution and mm. i think that's where we need to get the problem is that scotland's different from wales wales are different from england yeah. we don't all work together so and there's the, then there's the national trust and there's this and everyone it's not one way of doing it so um, and it's, it's quite interesting because um i won't say which guest now but one of the guests we've we've spoken to and and one of the challenges like just go out and just just run somewhere and wild camp as an, a mini adventure because the i think their their emphasis is more at the just challenging people to actually get in touch with nature to actually do something outside their comfort zone but then you're right it, that that can create problems if it's not done sensibly and if it's done at scale and if it's done irresponsibly and um, i think i think i know who that person is and he is very inspirational um, <laughs> he's a great man he's a great man he's a great, he's a great man and I, I bet he's, he's lovely but you know you th there is 100 there is this get out there and go and do stuff and you know there's the yes tribe and all this kind of stuff which is great but you've just got to educate people along with it because mm. if people are going along and misusing the countryside they're just it's going to create a negative reaction from the people in the area it's then going to close down. It's going to cause attrition. People are not going to be able to use it in the way they want to. Um, and you know, we have to accept where we live. Like if we have to go and only wild camp in certain areas, um, then that's what we have to do. Or if we have to use, if there's like hostels and we have to use them, then we have to use them. That's just the reality of where we live. Mm. We, we can't have our cake and eat it. We have to live within the constraints. And you know, the more responsible we are, the better and we use things and if we had to pay for stuff like become members of national trust or whatever to give them money so they can do up things and maintain stuff then we will i think end up with a more sustainable way forward and actually with with the the, the growth of veganism vegetarianism the changes in um in food and the way food's done and even the growth of meat that's then artificial meat things like that could suddenly create massive tracts of land that could be converted back to to trail or to nature or yeah. so who knows the impact of things like that that could in a generation suddenly just flip yeah, everything but, but i think on a positive look at it at the moment there are a few places that are incredibly incredibly popular and densely mm. populated with people on out adventuring there's also massive parts of the land where there is no one and we you still go mm. there and there's no one there so it's about teaching people to spread out mm. like we don't all have to go to the same place like these places are these places are going to be here long after we're here so they're not going anywhere so you know just spread out amazing well i was i, I was thinking at the very start of the interview we talk about the cycling stuff as well but actually it seems like we've come to a nice a nice end of this conversation so maybe that's a, a conversation for another podcast in a year or something um yeah. to pick things up whenever and and in terms of your your next challenges and um and and I guess also from what you said with your your desire to to do what you want to do, um, but also that awareness of promoting the right trails and um, and and doing doing a story. But now that you are more pressured into having to connect with people, partly because sponsors, partly because that's you need the financial stability of a successful trip. Um, like has that changed what you're viewing as things you want to do in the future and, and what things are on that list yeah i think so the next year i've got a very clear in my mind plan of what i'm going to do uh and part of that is like i've flown around the world a lot uh and then i kind of realized there's so much close to me that i do not need to be flying around the world for this year like let's keep it i bought a 1995 Ford transit camper van um, so I'm going to use that as a kind of base. Um, I have a, a big race planned. I'm not, I don't want to say what it is yet, uh, because I haven't got my ticket 100% stamped. What um, style? Uh, so I, so I basically, what well, I'm doing a bit of a, so 2017, 18, I got into multi-day stage running. So I did the Transalpine yeah. twice. I came third in the Cape Wrath Ultra. Um, and, uh, so I want to get back into that. So mm -hmm. let's say 
in July, I want to run 800 kilometers along the crest of the Pyrenees Mountains. Cool. So, uh, Self-supported. Um, yeah. And that I'm going to be using as a training run for the thing I want to do. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, race, yeah, the, the, ra the, the race I want to do in about a year's time. Um, <laughs> Amazing. Not, I don't want to jinx it. So, but it's kind of like, so running is my passion. Like I can get on a bike mm -hmm. and I feel happy. I can climb a mountain. I feel happy. I can ski. I feel happy. But running is my meditation. And I haven't been able to do it recently because of injuries. I've come back from that. I'm now training again. And I want, I want 2000 23 to be more running and using hiking as a mechanism for training so mm. i kind of okay. uh, and we've got so many trails around where i live and i want to come over to the uk and do more trails around like tick off some of the famous like proper established routes rather than just say uh, i'm going to run across iceland um, <laughs> just, um so i kind of i've done that for a few years i'm gonna just be i'm 43 i'm gonna act like i'm 43 for a year and uh but focus running because that's what makes me happy so. and um and in terms of um we've got a few questions to, to throw you away but just as a, another cheeky plug to the sponsors i mean what would you say your top your favorite bits of kit are that have been most useful in your your challenges um so i would definitely say that my favorite backpack two backpacks the ultimate direction uh fast pack 20 and the mountain vest five liter if you have those two backpacks for like small adventures, that's you absolutely sorted. Um, in terms of uh, shoes, I I want to I don't know if any runner sits with one shoe. I don't know how they do. I'm on constant involvement. I, I was Hoka Speed Goats and Mafates. They were like the best shoes in the world. And then recently, I've started running in Brooks, and I'm I've got a little pair of Brooks. I um, can't remember the name. I was running in them today, but they're really good for the kind of running right here um yeah. so but i i would say that that whatever if you're going to buy backpacks or running poles or all that kind of stuff just make sure you go and ask someone what the right stuff for you is because i've i've been guilty of buying the cool looking pair of trainers uh or when i was speaking to people like oh what kind of, they, they i've got good trainers because they're nike it's like that means absolutely nothing it doesn't, you have to ask someone how your foot hits the ground so yeah, I would say just I, I could say people this is the best piece of kit, but I'd say go and speak to experts in shops, in runners need, ask the guys there, they'll tell you what shoes to buy, not the ones you want to buy. So <laughs> amazing. Well, um, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. Actually, the um I didn't realize you were at Love Trails. I think we must have been in the same year. So um when was that? Two two years ago, three years ago? No, I was there the first one, two thousand and seventeen. Ah, I started in 18. Okay, so that's why we wouldn't have yeah. crossed over. Um, yeah, I watched you at the uh, when we did the towpath challenge to the national running show, and you had a stage. Oh yes, oh just stage. Show. Yes, yeah, yes. So yes. I came and watched. I came and watched you guys on that, and I I, I listened to Ali the other day at um, the Kendall Mountain Festival. Oh, how was it? Oh, she was brilliant. Oh, yeah, she was brilliant. Um, she was talking about uh, recovery and running, and uh, I, I, I felt awful because I did not know that's what the talk was, and I turned up with a mulled wine. Yeah. Um, but uh, oh, it was course, really, yeah. Yeah. it was, it was a really honest talk, um, and I'd heard her talk before at other things, but yeah, no, it was very good. Very good. But also, I mean, Ali's Ali's fine being around people tricking yeah. themselves. Oh, no, she, you know, she's not yeah, a, she was yeah, she yeah. was in the bar. She Come was on. saying about being in the bar and everything. No, it was a very good talk, and I think she touched on some things that I think lots of people in the audience probably went home and thought about and reflected upon. So. And have you now found your balance within alcohol or not, or does it depend on when and oh, where? Yeah, yeah. And... so I no, yeah, I'm. It's now all I. I it's a balance of everything. I'm not very good at balance. I'm like either. Let's do all cycling. Let's do all running. But this other stuff in life, I'm getting better at dealing with, <laughs> getting a nice series. I find actually if all those things, food is the thing I struggle with the most. Um, and I have, I like lots of adventures talk, talk about it. I have definitely have body dysmorphia problems. So uh, as soon as I put on a little bit of weight, like right now I've been injured. So I put on weight and then I get 
depressed because I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh my God, I don't look like an athlete and I'm meant to be an athlete. So I eat more and then I eat the wrong stuff. And then you kind of, and I go, right, I'm only going to have shakes now. Uh, and then that doesn't give you enough energy. So I'm like, nutrition is the thing uh, which is hard. So. To be honest, I want to speak about this for like another 20 minutes, but um, you've just thrown it into the end because I mean, that's fascinating. Actually, I, I know that's something that a lot of people who listen to the podcast um, are drawn to running almost as a, a way of trying to regulate. But actually, I, th I think a lot of runners are, um, are using running almost to cover up bad eating habits. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it is quite quite a common problem, actually within the sport it, it, it becomes harder i think the more the, the better you get at it because you tell people what you do and you can see them looking at you like i remember when i did the uh cape wrath ultra like people were like you're a trail runner i was like yeah I'm just slightly fatter than another one and then i came third so i was like put that in your place <laughs> like, you don't you don't have to look like a trail runner to be good at doing yeah. what you're doing you just have to do the work and you have to apply yourself and have the mental. So, yeah, the, the the food thing is something I've only started to admit to myself. So we'll talk about it in the future when I become more comfortable talking about it. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, I'll have a think if I know there's a we spoke to a guy in America called um, I think Alex Devlin who had written a, an article for Outside Magazine to do with body dysmorphia from um, when he'd been a track athlete and. If you wanted an intro, he was a uh, he was he was just a really nice guy who I'm sure would you know, yeah. speak to you from a place of um, experience and yeah, uh, yeah. compassion and all of that. So, um, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast, and, and thank you to thank your you lovely sponsors much. as well. And um, well, talking of the run show, if you wanted to come along, I'm sure we could make space on the stage. I'll, I'll message you about it. Yeah. Um, Fantastic, yeah. It's, I, I love going there because you just walk in. It's like, oh, my God, there's a whole bunch of people who are crazy as me. Um, and, True. And quite a few yeah, crazy so, as well, even, surprisingly. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah, they've got... yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Well, um, thanks so much for your time again. And uh, if there's anything we can do as a podcast to help you in the future, then just let me know. Thank you very much. Talk to you, buddy.